Shabbat Shalom and Erev Tov. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of the Biblical Research, and it is a good Shabbat today. The Lord has been so kind in making Himself known and His Word known, and uh, just some awesome revelations that He has given me, and I want to share those with you. And uh, some of it is things I've shared with you in the past, but some of it is a little bit new. It's kind of be something that we can just kind of combine together. So I want to take you without further ado to Psalm chapter 80. We're going to highlight uh, three different verses here in Psalm 80. Uh, first, I'm just beginning with verse 1. We'll read verse 1 to 3. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, that thou dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin. And Manasseh, stir up thy strength and come and save us. Uh, is what he says here. Ver then verse 3 says, Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Interesting, isn't it? Cause thy face to shine. Keep that in mind. Cause thy face to shine upon us, and we shall be saved. Let's drop down to verse 6. Uh, thou makest us a strife unto our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Verse 7, Turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Let's drop down to verse uh, 17. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou madest strong for thyself, verse 18, so will not we go back from thee, quicken us, and we will call upon thy name. Turn us again, O Lord God, verse 19, of hosts, cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Now, it's interesting, Psalm 80 prophesies of three different events, three different time frames in Israel's history of when God would send his salvation forth. And in every case, God's face would shine upon the Jewish people and they would be saved. The last one, though, is when he says in uh, verse 18, So will not we go back from thee, quicken us, and we will call upon thy name. Don't forget that. It's very important we remember that prophecy as well. And I want to look at these. Now, keep in mind, now David is the one that wrote this, but it actually goes back in time, and it looks at the first time that God's face shined upon Israel is in the story of Moses in Exodus. So it's actually referring back. It is looking back in time. And we know that in Exodus 20, uh, God first has Moses go up. He gives him the Ten Commandments, but not written on stone as of yet. He comes down, he relays this to the children of Israel. When he goes up again, this time he tarries for a while while he's there. And of course, Moses comes back down from the mountain. And when he does, he finds, as the Lord had told him already, he had prophesied to him that the children of Israel were uh, not so much prophesying, but he was telling them that their sins, they were they had they had already gone away from God. They had turned aside, and he finds that they had made the golden calf uh, with Aaron uh, in, involved in this. And, of course, Moses was angry. He breaks the commandments, which clearly is a prophecy that Israel would not believe Moses' first ministry. They, they, they rejected uh, Moses in the first time that he comes. They break that covenant. But, um, so therefore, he comes down. We read nothing about Moses' face shining with the glory of God, though. But on the second return, this time, Moses comes down. We read this and we find that his face doth shine. Uh, and this is in chapter 34. And the Lord said unto Moses, verse 1, uh, Hew thee two tables of stone, like unto the first. And I will write upon these two tables the words that were in the first tables, when the, uh, which thou breakest, and be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the uh, flocks nor herds feed there, uh, feed before that mount. Now, we know he goes up. 
God also, because Moses had asked to be able to see God, he wanted him to show him the way. Well, Christ is that way. We clearly know that. And God says that he would. He tells him that he will. He says, and I will declare my name when he comes. He said he would declare his name. And so when God hides Moses into the cleft of the rock, and as he passes by him, he shows him the back part of a man. And God goes forth declaring the divine name of God, Hashem, the yod He vav He, as many people call it today, Yahweh, which is not correct. Clearly, it is not correct. In fact, there is a prophecy where Moses, uh, that is, or a scripture that's never been fulfilled. Moses says to God, early on in Exodus, I think, chapter 3, he says, they will ask me, what is your name? Mashimo. He says, what do I tell them? And of course, God says at that time, tell them, Ihaye asha Ihaye shelachani. Uh, I, I am that which I will be, has sent thee unto you. And that's what he was to declare to them, but not his divine name. It was letting you know that he will be, he will prove who he is, but that would be at a future date. And clearly, nowhere in Scripture do we ever find where the children of Israel actually asked Moses, what is God's divine name? They don't ask. So the Scripture was never fulfilled. And yet, we're finding, even according to Psalm chapter 80 and verse 18, quicken us, we will call upon thy name. This is going to be at the third time that God's face is to shine upon them that would bring salvation. So, at any rate, and we also see uh, another scripture that is not fulfilled, and this is in uh, chapter 34, verse 10. And this is God speaking to Moses. Uh, actually, it's back into verse 9. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin. Take us for thine inheritance. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels such as I have not, not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. That's God's divine name. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with you. Speaking directly to Moses. Now, he's already done the plagues in Egypt. Moses had already, you know, God had used him to part the Red Sea. He brought all kinds of plagues out and everything. And now there's a prophecy that God is going to do greater than anything that's been done thus far. And he's going to use Moses to do it. Well, that's kind of odd. Now watch what he says. Verse 11. Observe thou that which I commanded thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whether thou goest, lest it be a snare in the midst of thee. God never let Moses go to the promised land, but now he's talking about that they should not make any covenants where he's going. So God has promised Moses that he will go to this promised land, but yet later we find that God says that he's not going in because why? He smote the rock in his anger when God told him to speak to the rock. Now, that was two different events. The first time, he was commanded to smite the rock that would bring forth its waters with the children of Israel to judge the rock. The elders of Israel were to judge that rock, which was a foreshadowing Christ, that the Levites, the, the priests, would be the ones that would judge Christ when he would come, and then they would smite him, that the waters of life could come forth. See, my rabbinical brethren, this is why our forefathers rejected him. My fathers were there and rejected the Messiah. But it was in order to bring forth life. And those that critics I see constantly blaming the Jews out here. The, you, you put your comments out there saying that, you know, how can you listen to Jews? They rejected Christ, but they were blinded for your sake. Otherwise, there would be no life for the Gentiles. God had to blind them in order for him to turn to the Gentiles. So just keep that in mind there. So anyway... But he says, but you shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. 
did, did we just did we did we miss something here? This is God directly. Let me let me pull this up for you here. I really want you to be able to see this here. Um, let me take it. Exodus 33. I'm going to pull it up in the Hebrew for you. It's very very important that we we don't miss this here. But God is speaking to Moses directly. He's not speaking to someone else. Uh, we're in 34, verse, what was that verse? But you shall, but yeah, you shall destroy their altars. Verse 13. Sometimes in Hebrew, it, it falls in a different verse, verse forward or verse afterwards, depending on how the scripture's laid out in there. Let me just look on here. But you shall destroy their altars. Okay, now verse 13. Uh, your gimel is the verse that's in Kiev. Uh, yeah, look at, looking at several of the verses here in, in the Hebraic language, even if you go back to verse 12, uh, take heed to thyself, or to yourself. He is speaking specifically to Moses. It is a singular, okay? He also says to him, okay? So uh, again, and it's where, uh, whether thou goest, it's, it's, it's to him. It's to specifically to Moses. The prophecy is directly to Moses. Okay? But you shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars, and you shall cut down their asherim, their groves. Um, everywhere here, God is directing this specifically to Moses himself. And so therefore, in order for Moses to do this in, these, in this land, in, to, in the land of the promised land, the Israel, he's got to go there. But yet we clearly see that God said that he would not go there. So it clearly is a prophecy for the future. Now, let's go ahead and get though to the part of the shining of the face. Moving down, uh, verse 29, we'll drop, we'll drop way down here. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables uh, uh, of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses was not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. That's why he was talking with the Lord. His face was shining. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, uh, behold, the skin of his face is shown. It was glowing. It was, it was literally projecting out. In Hebrew, it's like the glow just emanated out from him. Um, and not just, it, it, it was supernatural, but it was very visible supernatural. And his skin and his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh to him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him. And Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them the commandment, all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And uh, till Moses had done speaking with them and put a veil on his face. But when he went before the Lord, he took the veil off. Now, this is Psalm 80. This is the first one. Uh, even though David is speaking of it as a future, it is actually the first time that we can find biblically where God's face did shine upon Israel, and it was salvation. And again, we go back to it. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up thy strength and come and save us. Uh, turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. And naturally, he did. He saved them. And of course, interestingly enough, uh, even Manassas, Benjamin, and Ephraim were all there at that time. Uh, but we go down to verse 7, verse 6 and 7 in, 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 uh, in the book of Psalms. says, Thou makest us strife unto our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Well, the time when Yeshua came, they had become a laughing stock. They had already been pretty much conquered by the Romans, and they were a laughing stock. So he says, Turn again us again, O God, and of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. And did God do it? Yes, he did. We find in Matthew chapter 17. And after six days, Jesus talk, uh, taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared a, 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 unto them Moses and Elijah, or Elias, talking with him. 
Then answered Peter and said unto uh, Yeshua, Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles and one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. Now, another beautiful thing, salvation had come once again. And this time it was Yeshua that was shining. And it also shows who Moses was actually talking to on Mount Sinai. He was talking to none other than what you see, Yeshua in the, in the human body was the Son of God. But on Mount Transfiguration, excuse me, not on Mount Transfiguration, but, uh, but at Mount Sinai, that was who was standing there with Moses when he saw the back part of a man. Because you've got to remember, the Father is invisible, and no one can see the Father. But he let him see the back part of a man. And what did he do? He went and declared the name of Almighty God. That's also signifying Moses' second ministry when he returns again. Remember the first time Moses comes with the commandments that he breaks them because the children of Israel has caused the commandment of God to be broken and they do not receive it. The same with Christ. They never received it. They didn't receive Moses' first ministry. But God said a strange thing to Moses. In Exodus, he makes this statement here, and I'm just paraphrasing for you. He says, if they do not believe the voice of the first sign, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. Now, the voice of the sign was not the same thing as when Moses shows the stick turning to a serpent in his hand to leprosy. It's after those two physical signs that he shows him, God says to Moses, if they don't believe the voice of the first sign, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. And clearly, Israel did not believe when Moses came the first time. Not even in Exodus 20, when he comes and verbally gives the Ten Commandments, Israel doesn't believe. They get into all kinds of mischief. He goes up, comes down with the commandments, and he breaks them because why? Israel did not believe because God said, if they don't believe the voice of the first sign, and Moses was the voice of God to the people. Now, he said they will believe the voice of the latter sign. Well, the latter sign, or the or the, uh, the the latter rain, we might say, in the Hebrew language there, where God promises to send that message again, he comes again. This time, Moses will be believed. And clearly, we find over here in, in Exodus 34 that God is going to send him again and do a work like it's never been done before, a work of judgment, a work of wrath of Almighty God, greater than that of what he did in Egypt with Moses. Now, that's, that's God's words. And he doesn't say anything about sending Aaron with him. He says he's going to send Moses, and Moses will drive out the occupants. Moses will tear down the altars to Baal, and that's what's going to happen in Israel. He's coming back to tear down these altars. So we see that Yeshua was that one there. Now, I ran across the scripture when I was looking up this shown, this face is being shown. I, I was just trying to Find it in the scripture. Where would it be? Because if clearly in Psalm 80, there's three different places where the, the, the Lord's face is asked to be shined upon them for salvation, then God will have three places where it's visible in the scripture. Moses is one. Christ was the other one. Let's go back and read Psalm 80 again, though. This one is in verse 18 and 19. Backing up to verse 17. Let thy hand be upon... Uh, the man of thy right hand upon the son of man whom thou madest strong for thyself so will not we go back from thee quicken us and we will call upon thy name interesting well when they go to call upon God's name it's because they do ask Moses what his name is. And of course, the scripture says that God will reveal his divine name and says when he will do it. He will restore a pure language into the people that they may all be able to call upon his name. And that's what it says here. They'll call upon his name. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts. Cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved. Well, they were saved through Christ. That was where that second shining come. And of course, that was the shining of salvation. But another interesting place written in the scripture is in Daniel chapter 12. 
And uh, let me take you to this one right here. This one really got my attention. We read verse 1, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Salvation is going to come to Israel at a time of trouble like never before. And we're about to see that in Israel very soon. Okay? Everyone that shall be found written in the book, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, it makes it sound like we're at the, at the millennium. But we don't have the time of trouble like never before on the earth in the millennium. Notice though verse 3. This one really got me. And I've read it many times. I'm sure you have as well. But I never thought about it the way I thought about it today. In verse 3 it says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Could that be the ministry of the two witnesses? They come back shining. What caught my attention about it, it says, because the ones that are shining, that be wise and shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness. The ones that are shining are the ones that turn many to righteousness. And when are they turning many to righteousness? When Israel is in a place where it's a time of trouble like never before in all the earth. Is it the ministry of the two witnesses right there? Could very well be. In fact, it looked like to me that that may be exactly so. Let's look at another place here. In Obadiah, beginning, let me take you back to verse 15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, and shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Fear, for, excuse me, for as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, which is the Roman Catholic Pope, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. Now, the heathen are the Gentiles, and it is the Roman Gentiles drinking on, the, on Mount Zion. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Interesting. Is it possible that the temple treasures are restored? Is it possible, too, that Ken Klein that sent his video to me back a few years ago asking me what I thought about this idea that the Temple Mount really was actually on Mount Zion or right around that area around Mount Zion and not on the Temple Mount? Could it be an agenda? Could it be a plot in order for them to build the third temple, not on the Temple Mount, not where it should be, but actually in another location that the Vatican owns? Well, maybe, maybe very well so. And could Israel once again possess their possessions? Good possibility as well that Rome, or somehow they may just mysteriously appear in some dig. Because Rome is very capable of moving those treasures and putting them in a place to make it look like that the temple actually sat there. And there's a great movement on trying to prove Bob Cornuk is involved in that. Even Chuck Missler uh, was in an interview with Bob Cornuk about that. Of course, I know Bob, know Chuck, even know Ken Klein, all three of the men. But I'm wondering, is that just a plot? But nonetheless, the scripture will be fulfilled no matter what. So it says here, but upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. Interesting, isn't it? Esau. Esau is the Romans, by the way. When you read through here, you find out real quick, like in, in Obadiah, that, that, that Rome is Esau. Uh, for the Lord hath spoken it, and they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain of the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim. And the fields of Samaria and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall, uh, shall 
possess that of the Canaanites, even into Zarephath, and the captivity of Jerusalem, which is the Seraphod, shall possess the cities of the south. Notice all these things that are being possessed. Didn't God say to Moses, you'll drive them out? Even naming some of the exact same names. But then verse 21, And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau and the kingdom shall be the Lord. Saviors. Do you know that's in the plural in Hebrew? Moshini, Moshim. I actually was thinking at one time that meant uh, anointed, Moshiach, Moshachim, because it looks almost exactly the same, but it literally is. I double-checked that. I went back, so I stand corrected on that. It's actually from the word Yeshua, salvation, and it is there in the plural. Again, could it be the two witnesses? Because we know there's only one Savior, and that's Christ Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. But on Mount Zion, there are more than one. It's actually translated as deliverers. Very interesting. But we know that the two witnesses definitely come as a pair. And it only makes you wonder if Daniel is actually seeing the same thing in Daniel when the, uh, as the face goes shine. And, wow, it, just amazing to me. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness. Because we know the two witnesses are coming to turn ungodliness from Jacob and righteousness to Israel. Fulfilling Daniel 9, 24, 25, 26 there, where that where the sin of Israel will be pardoned and blotted out. Revelation 11 where we see that the two witnesses come and they bring all manner of plagues upon the earth and cast all kinds of things. Even Yeshua, they ask Yeshua. In fact, right after the Mount Transfiguration where Yeshua's face does shine, they ask him, doesn't the scripture say that Elias must first come? Yeshua says he shall, he's truly, he shall, puts it in the future, first come and restore all things. Now John the Baptist was already dead when he says that. But then Jesus goes a little further and says, But I say unto you, he came already and did whatever was listed of him. See, John the Baptist, now he's not talking about, he's talking about John the Baptist there, but it's not the, John, it's not the Elias that comes in the future to restore all things. That's Elijah coming back, because the restoration of all things is when Israel recognizes her Messiah. And Elijah comes to do that with Moses with him. Clearly, the signs in Revelation 11, the water to blood and the fire being coming, proceeding from the mouth and destroying the enemies, both signs in the heavens being stopped that it doesn't rain, clearly a sign of Elijah and a sign of Moses. And God has clearly said, both men will be back. I'm Stephen Benoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Shabbat Shalom. Be blessed. Enjoy your Shabbat. Enjoy it in Him. Worship Him, praise Him, seek Him, for this is the day that He has made. God bless you. Thank you, thank you for being a part of this ministry. Thank you for supporting this ministry. We need your support, and we thank you for it, for your love and kindness and caring for us. And thank you for us. God bless you.